Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing with Montgomery County Executive Mark Erich. I'm Lorna Vergelli, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. Keisha Davis, the <coughs> County's Health Officer, as well as Dr. Nina Ashford, Chief of Public Health Services, Dr. James Bridgers, Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Deputy Chief for Public Health Services, and Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. We have a special guest today, Dr. Scott Bruton, who is the Director of the Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Mr. County Executive, the floor is yours. Hello, and uh, thank you everybody again for joining us this week. Um, first, I wanna begin the briefing by offering my condolences to Council President Andrew Friedson, whose father suddenly, pa suddenly passed away. Our thoughts are with him and his family during this difficult time. May his memory be a blessing to all of you. I, I wanna start now with um, joining and welcoming Dr. Thomas Taylor as the new superintendent of Montgomery County Public Schools. His selection was announced this um, yesterday with an official vote from the school board coming next week on uh, June 25th. Our schools are a key reason that people choose to live in Montgomery County and why businesses relocate or stay here. Maintaining MCPS's quality of education, academic, river, ac academic rigor, and commitment to inclusion and, and the reputation as one of the best public school systems is really essential. We welcome Dr. Taylor's energy and engagement. I think we all understand the urgency of the situation that MCPS currently faces in terms of the budget, staffing, class size, and providing the appropriate resources to our students, teachers, staff, and families that MCPS serves. I appreciated the comments he made at his press conference yesterday expressing his commitment to transparency while working with and listening to all the various stakeholders within the MCPS community. Transparency has been, been a big issue, both for the public and with the County Council and myself. So steps to address that are just really critically important I think the more transparent they can be, uh, the easier it is to make the case for the needs that they have in the system. Uh, Dr. Taylor made it clear that it is a priority for him to continue to foster inclusion and diversity in our schools. He not only has a PhD in education, but he's also an MBA who understands and enjoys the dollar and cents of school management. And he understands that it's critically important. And I appreciated the time that I got to meet with him yesterday and I look forward to working with him as we go forward. Next, I'd like to express my thanks to the County Council for confirming Mark Yamada as the next Chief of Montgomery County Police Department yesterday. I appreciate their support and look forward to working with him in his new position following Chief Marcus Jones' retirement on June 30th. Chief Yamada has had a great career with MCPD that has been marked by dedication, courage, and unwavering commitment to the safety and well-being of our community. He will be the first Japanese-American leader of our police department. He's the first person in his family who was born in the United States, and he did grow up in Wheaton. I think his background fits very well with the kind of inclusive and diverse community Montgomery County has become, and I know he understands the seriousness of dealing with issues, particularly around diversity in this community. Our department has made significant strides over the last few years, and I'm proud to say we have one of the best law enforcement institutions in the nation, but we will continue to work to make it even better. There's still more work we can do, and we're going to do it. I believe under Chief Yamada's leadership that the department will enhance that good work that's already been done, and I look forward to partnering with them as we go forward. I want to commend Governor Moore for his decision to issue pardons for individuals convicted of nonviolent cannabis offenses. This action is important for many Montgomery County residents, particularly in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by past cannabis laws. These pardons help to right the wrongs of a system that has unfairly targeted minority communities for decades. Governor Moore's executive order, which pardons 175,000 residents, is a historic move that addresses longstanding injustices. By clearing the records of these convictions, um, we are taking a significant step toward improving their economic prospects. A criminal record can be a substantial barrier to employment, housing, and other opportunities. And by removing these barriers, we enable individuals to rebuild their lives and contribute positively to our community. 
We all pay a price when people who could contribute to society are barred from doing that. And we all have to think of what are the consequences if a person can't get a job and can't find housing? I think we can all imagine pretty vividly what people might do if they're unable to work. Many of our residents have faced undue hardships because of past cannabis convictions. These pardons offer a chance for a fresh start and it's an essential step toward justice and equity, particularly for communities of color that have been disproportionately affected by, affected by the stringent cannabis laws. Even here in Montgomery County, we know the cannabis usage and prior misdemeanors matter when it comes to applying to be a police officer. I'm glad of the progress we're making to reform these requirements. And I hope that with the governor's actions yesterday, we will continue to help increase the potential applicants and recruits. Governor Moore's leadership on this issue is commendable. He's shown compassion to those charged and convicted of misdemeanor possession of cannabis or misdemeanor use or possession with intent to use uh, prior to January 1st, 2023 when possession of a personal use amount of cannabis was actually legalized. The pardons also forgive misdemeanor use or possession with intent to use drug paraphernalia charges if they were the only criminal charges incurred. The governor's decision not only aligns with the principles of fairness and justice, but also reflects a commitment to fostering an inclusive and supportive environment for all Maryland residents. And I'm optimistic these pardons will help many individuals in Montgomery County and across the state to overcome past challenges and to be able to seize new opportunities. Uh, Governor Moore's executive order also directs the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services to develop a process to indicate on an individual's criminal record that the conviction was pardoned. This process is expected to take approximately 10 months to complete. This executive order is a meaningful step toward rectifying the inequities in our legal system. And I look forward to continuing to to continuing to work with the governor to support initiatives that address disparities and promote well-being for all of our residents. And a little update on rent stabilization. On Friday, my office sent new rent stabilization regulations to the county council. You may remember we celebrated a big victory last year when the council passed rent stabilization legislation, capping yearly increases at 6%. It's higher than I wanted, but it was better than unreasonable caps that had been otherwise proposed. This legislation is a critical step in protecting our residents from predatory price gouging, and it keeps our local housing market prices somewhat in check. As housing costs continue to rise, it's essential that we have measures in place to ensure that our community remains affordable for everyone. These regulations and policies are designed to provide the framework to help renters struggling to keep up with rapidly increasing housing costs, which threaten their ability to remain in their homes. Tens of thousands of families in our county devote too much of their take home pay to rent, and they live paycheck to paycheck. Too often, their only safety net is the support our county and our community partners can give. Because of severe cuts to federal and state programs that were meant to provide rent support, we're actually gonna be forced this year to reduce the number of people who have access to the safety net programs with a likely result, the more people will face homelessness. And that is really unfortunate. These regulations also offer significant assurances for property owners. There are opportunities to apply for exceptions to the caps. For example, when considering the cost of major projects to improve living conditions that ensure property owners can continue to make necessary improvements while also maintaining a fair rate of return. A fair return policy aims to balance landlord profitability with tenant affordability. To learn more about what everyone can expect from these new guidelines, I wanna welcome in the director of our Department of Housing and Community Affairs, Scott Bruton. And Scott can talk to you about why en enacting these regulations quickly is so important. So Scott, it's all yours. Thank you very much, County Executive. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, uh, we submitted, as the county executive said, submitted the regulations to council on Friday. Uh, the council now has a review period uh, of up to 60 days. We hope the review period uh, will be shorter than that. Um, we have already engaged with council staff, council staff and uh, council yeah. attorneys uh, to explain our process, explain the new regulations. Uh, to help them in their deliberative process. Um, the regulations helped enact 
uh, and implement the law that was passed uh, last year um, and cover everything, everything from how can rent decreases uh, occur to, as the county executive indicated, how landlords uh, can apply to get uh, rent decreases or surcharges to do capital improvements, to improve their building, uh, to uh, if they do uh, enough renovations to their building to get a new exemption for their property for 23 years, or to make sure that they get a fair return on their investment. Uh, the regulations also cover uh, the regulation of fees. Uh, this is something that not all rent stabilization programs do. As many of you know, uh, across the country, the issue of uh, as uh, folks term it, junk fees has become significantly problematic, not only in rental housing industry, but vacationing and, and a variety of other industries. And the council uh, put in there to regulate fees so that they would not be used as alternatives for increasing rent beyond what is included in the law. Um, and we have a variety of processes and procedures. Another one that may be of interest to folks is that in the law, it declares that a property that under our current law for troubled and at-risk properties that has significant uh, housing code violations are not allowed to increase their rents. And so we have provisions of the law to allow landlords to navigate that process to be removed from the troubled and at-risk property list if they deal with housing code violations and other requirements in existing law, as well as other avenues for them to get rent increases if they do not feel that they have uh, the financial wherewithal to make the required repairs. Um, it's a long and complicated set of regulations, so I'm happy to answer uh, additional questions uh, both broadly and specific uh, if the uh, attending media has them. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bruton. Members of the media, we're going to open it up right now for questions uh, regarding rent stabilization in the county. I see Kelly Ling from uh, ABC7. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, you did. Right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking me. Um, I wanted to um, ask Mr. Elrich a question. Is he available to answer our yeah. questions right now? Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, this is about uh, Mark Yamada and some concerns oh. within the oh. community. Can we hold that to the end so we can just do the housing stuff now? Okay, no problem. To you at the end. Okay, great. Thank you. Brad Bell, Brad, do you have any questions regarding <clears throat> the conversation housing? Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. And I was not here for the, uh, the statements. Um, I was in Prince George's County Council where they just uh, where they just um, approved their version. Um, and I just wanted to know, you know, broadly in broad terms, um, why is 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 this rent stabilization package the, the way to go? Um, how do you balance the needs of the consumer versus the desires of developers and that sort of thing, Mr. County Exec? You know, it's very hard to balance needs and desires. And I'll just say they're not equal things on any kind of balancing scale. I mean, I desire a lot of things, which I probably will never get. What I need is very different than what I desire. But I think, you know, more fundamentally, um, we've got tens of thousands of people who spend more than half their income on rent. These are people who go to work every day. And they bring home paychecks that are not sufficient to cover the rents in the county. We have landlords that insist on raising their rents faster than their expenses are going up. And you can tell by the, you know, the opposition to the bill initially, where landlords whose expenses exceeded what some of us had hoped would be a lower cap could have come in and gotten increased rent increases simply by demonstrating that their costs were going up faster than the renting normal rent increase would allow. And the fact that people oppose something reasonable like that tells you a lot about, they're not concerned about the tenants, not concerned about their well-being, uh, not concerned about the impact of people losing their housing because they can't continue to afford to pay rent. Uh, where I sit, I have to care about those things. I don't have a pocketbook interest in this. I have a social interest in this. I'm a county executive of a county that tries to be inclusive and make sure everybody has opportunities 
to be successful and to continue to live here. Um, rising prices in, influence the rate of homelessness. They push people out. Rising prices force people to live in overcrowded living conditions. You have two families or sometimes more living in one and two bedroom apartments because it's the only way they can afford to live here. And these are people who work here. Um, so <laughs> I guess you could, you could solve this problem if everybody got a $25 minimum wage. That might get it to the point when people could afford a lot higher a lot higher rents, but we're not able to go there realistically, at least not now. And so some control on rents is critical in order to make sure that people have the ability to continue living here. And this rent control as a concept was upheld by the Supreme Court after World War II. They recognized it as legitimate business of government to ensure that you know housing isn't simply a commodity where you can displace people because you wanna make more money from them than they can afford to pay, or so you can displace them and move in other people with higher incomes and leave these people without housing. So it's a complex answer, but you know, our desires and our needs are very different. And if I, had to, if I had legislated for everybody's desires, I don't think I could ever pay for a budget like that. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So Sam Polak, Miami Media, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thanks. I just want to um, make sure I understand because it seems like you did this already. You got the 6% um, shelf. So what is what more is this um, bill that you put to council for on Friday? Um, I think uh, I think there's it might be a misunderstanding. Yeah. The, the law that was passed required uh, the department uh, and the county executive to promulgate regulations to implement the law. Okay, yeah. And so we uh, published those uh, months back in January um, and then uh, received comments over the comment period. We received uh, around 400 pages uh, worth of comments recommending changes in the draft regulations that we had published. And then what we sent over to the county executive sent over to council on Friday was the revised version uh, based on uh, the recommended changes we had received from uh, stakeholders, advocates, and the general public. Can you just tell me one or two of the biggest ones? Changes. Um, sure. Um, when uh, Trying to think, I don't know if this is too weedy for you all, but <laughs> uh, for example, for the capital improvement and fair return means to get a rent surcharge or an increase in rent, uh, uh, the industry, the, the landlord industry had requested instead of a one-step process uh, to have a two-step process so that there would be less risk for them in determining uh, before they started making renovations um, uh, that uh, the, the uh, renovations would be approved. So many of the changes we made were process and procedure changes uh, that uh, either the industry or, land, or, or the uh, or the tenant advocate groups had requested. Some were clarifications of the law, um, and then also one of the big issues for the for the uh, for the industry had been. Uh, dealing with the troubled property, uh, troubled and at-risk property restriction on increasing their rents. And so we had originally provided one means for them to move forward uh, in order to uh, be able to make uh, rent increases if you have that designation. And we provided a second means uh, for, for them to do that as long as they had corrected all their violations and complied with other parts of the law. We did also make some changes to the way we regulate fees. Um, the, uh, the industry as well as tenant advocacy groups had questioned some of the initial proposals that we had made about how to regulate fees. And so our new rent stabilization staff uh, did significant research over months, getting in touch with um, over a hundred rental properties around the county in all ge different geographic areas, different levels from low cost rentals to you know high, uh, you know like relatively new rentals, 
to find out what types of fees were being charged, what the fee rates were, so that we could see what's the industry doing, what's the general industry practice, what are the averages, um, and then what are some fees that most of the industry doesn't charge. And we used that research to revise um, how, we're, how we're regulating fees and what can be charged. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Suzanne. Any more questions regarding this topic, members of the media? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bruton, for joining us this afternoon. You can remain on this event or you can drop off if you need to go. Thanks for joining us, Mr. County Executive. So I just want to thank Scott for being on today. And uh, we are community um, efforts to make sure the housing remains affordable and that renters are not at the mercy of unchecked rent increases. Let's, let's move forward now with enacting these regulations and uphold the spirit of rent stabilization that will help protect the well-being of our residents. And I hope the council acts quickly. We know already that there are landlords who are hurrying to try to get rent increases in place um, before the deadline. And uh, we've already seen you know, reports of rent increases as high as 50%, uh, not many at that level, but things between 10 and 25% um, are not uncommon apparently. So it's something to worry about. Uh, Finally, I just want to talk about um, Juneteenth and the county celebration before we go to the health update. Tomorrow's a big day for Montgomery County. It's not simply a federal holiday, not just a day off of work. We have all been given an opportunity to take part in what many in the Black community would call their own Independence Day. The Juneteenth holiday honors June 19th, 1865, the day that Union soldiers arrived to take control of Texas and enforce the eman emancipation of slaves in that state. Tomorrow, tomorrow, government offices will be closed, but there will be a full day of activity, shows, and ways to honor our history. The second annual Scotland Juneteenth Heritage Festival will end with fireworks tomorrow night at Shirley Povich Field in Cabin John Park starting at 9.45 p.m. It will be preceded by a baseball game, a community dinner, and a parade at the park in Rockville. Cabin John Village will host a classic car show, children's art show, and history lessons throughout the day. And if you show up anytime between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., you'll have a chance to see those who signed up for the Juneteenth Scott Talent Showcase. I want to thank all our community partners who help us put together so many celebrations across our community in honor of Juneteenth. And we have published a press release detailing many of them that you can now find on the county uh, website now. Over the past week, our Juneteenth has seen an enormous outpouring of support. We kicked it off last Friday night by honoring our community's African-American living legends. On Saturday, I was in Germantown to help welcome everyone for the county's annual Juneteenth celebration at Black Rock. While this is going on, there are other celebrations around the county as well. I hope everyone can think a minute about the significance of this holiday for the Black community. It is the equivalent of celebrating the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. These landmark events, frankly, in the history of white men in America, rang pretty hollow for slaves and women who endured living without basic human rights for more than 100 years after America was created. Even the Black soldiers who fought in our wars to preserve our democracy <laughs> were effectively blocked from participating in that democracy. So just think about it a minute. It helps understand why we still struggle with the racial underpinnings of the inequalities that persist into the present. The most serious of these inequalities didn't happen that long ago. They happened in the lifetime of many of us who are possibly hearing this today. Juneteenth is a holiday that we should have been recognizing and celebrating long before just three years. Before I open it up to questions, I'd like to ask my staff if they have any updates on the health front to share. Hello, thank you, Mr. County Executive. I do have one brief update. I think as folks are aware, uh, it is getting warm outside. And so we just wanted to remind our residents that for our senior residents who we define as 60 years or older, um, we do have fans and emergency kits available. You can receive one or both by calling 240 
777-3000, Thank you. And we just want to share again with the public, uh, as we always do, we, we maintain surveillance of uh, COVID variants and um, COVID activity in the community. We are continuing to see, as we mentioned last week, an uptick in, uh, in hospitalizations related to COVID. Um, we are still at a, a what we would char characterize a low level. It's not impacting service at all, um, but we are seeing uh, what we've seen in, in past summers, a, a rise in cases during the summer. Just lastly, I'll add again, um, going back to the heat, um, we are under uh, heat advisory for the next several days and encourage you to um, make sure that you're taking precautions for yourself and your children and the elderly, as Dr. Ashford mentioned. Um, check on a neighbor, make sure that they are doing okay, um, and reminder to not leave kids or pets in hot cars outside. It doesn't take long for that temperature to get um, unbearable. So make sure that you are looking out for uh, each other, check in on a neighbor and um, make sure that we are taking those precautions to get out of the sun and stay rehydrated. Thank you everyone. <clears throat> Members of the media, we're gonna open it up right now for your questions. Okay, Kaylee Lynn, ABC7, there you are, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, hello. Thank you again for taking me. I, I wanted to uh, ask Mr. Elrich about concerns within the community about Mark Yamada. Um, there has been some criticism that because there wasn't a national search conducted, that perhaps this is going to lead to more of the status quo, um, more specifically, an over-reliance on police and race-based disparities at schools, traffic enforcement, the use of force and mental health crisis response. How do you respond to that, please? Uh, kind of like they're fundamentally wrong. Um, al almost everything you mentioned is a policy that is not a chief's policy. Um, the, the mental health response is something that, for example, that we've been trying to increase in our budget for a couple of years. So last year we put three mental health teams out because that's what we could afford. We added two more mental health teams this year, those are county priorities and they're priorities of myself and the council, but the expansion of those programs has been limited by budget, but we are putting people back, you know, on the street doing these teams. There is nothing that is really, um, the, the chief of the department runs the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, he's not making, you know, all the long-term policies. The school system's involved deeply in what they want in the school system in terms of uh, uh, policing. And so we had no ability to impose anything on the school system. And the school system was part of the discussions before. And if their desire is for change, and we'll see what the new superintendent wants, then we have the, op the ability to have those discussions. Um, when I thought about, you know, where I should go for a police chief. I mean, I'll be blunt. There aren't many police departments in this country that I would want here, particularly big ones. And there aren't many police departments in this country that have made the efforts that we've made over the last few years to try to deal with this issues around racial inequity and the policing we do. And I think if people are objective about our police, this is not a department that gets us in the newspaper every day. You know, as prevalent as, as cameras are, our folks don't make camera appearances because they conduct themselves in a way that by and large has been really, I think, respectful and, you know, appropriate for our community. And I felt like I wanted the chief who had experience with going through this transition. You know, well, we did a lot of work over the last three years. Um, we did a really thorough evaluation of our department we made changes to how we train police officers. We did a lot of fundamental work. And I could bring in somebody who didn't have that experience and wasn't working in the department that had tried, been trying to transform himself. Or I could bring in somebody who was in this department, had been through that transformative process, and had been positive about the transformative process. So I feel pretty comfortable with this. We are going to be appointing another civilian chief. Um, that will, again, we'll go back to the effort to try to make sure the civilian chief is kind of in tune with the eyes and ears of the community and provides, you know, greater input 
and their voices will certainly have a direct ability to be heard in the department because they'll have a, an assistant chief they can go to. But Mark's going to be responsive and available for other people as well. So I feel comfortable with what I did. And I did not believe that I could look around this country and find other big departments where I'd say, hey, I can get somebody from there and it'll be just fine. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Members of the media, any other questions for the county executive and uh, the officials? Any more questions this afternoon? No more questions? Go once. Well, I have one more thing to say. I made, okay. a goof, I made a goof when I said about his confirmation. I thought it was this morning. It's actually they're, on, they're doing the confirmation process now. So I hope he's confirmed today rather than he's been confirmed. Yeah, you really threw me off with that one. Yeah. Thank Sorry you for that. <laughs> clearing that one up. <laughs> you know how time blurs sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, members of the media, any more questions, clarifications, anything else we need to add today? Yeah, going once, going twice. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe this afternoon, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all.